Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth plenary of the SIAM CSE 2019. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Boyce Griffith, Associate Professor of Mathematics at UNC Chapel Hill, and he's going to talk to us today about fluid structure interaction in uh, biology and medicine. Uh, I should also note that he is an adjunct associate professor in the joint UNC-NC State program in biomedical engineering, as well as a pillar of the computational medicine program at UNC. Uh, uh, he re received his BA in computational applied mathematics from Rice University and a simultaneous BS in computer science. He went on to obtain his PhD from, in mathematics from Courant, uh, where he did his subsequent postdoctoral work. And uh, before moving to UNC, he was a faculty member at the NYU School of Medicine. Along the way, he was awarded the DOE Computational Science Graduate Fellowship, the Kurt O. Friedrichs Outstanding Dissertation Award, the Whitehead Postdoctoral Fellowship, the Medtronic American Heart Association Postdoctoral Fellowship, and the NSF Career Award. Whew. All right. Uh, so I should say something about the, the work. Uh, his... Uh, his research focuses, according to his website, on uh, developing and applying methods uh, to understand biological dynamics and medical devices and clinical interventions. Uh, but what I find most amazing is his ability to combine deep mathematics with robust software infrastructure and uh, actual clinical practice. Uh, he's also done foundational work in the numerical analysis of immersed boundary methods, uh, notably uh, the application to immersed structures using finite elements, and also the so scalable solution of the resulting algebraic systems using multigrid. Boyce is the creator and unstoppable force behind the IBAMR open source toolkit for immersed boundary simulation uh, using structured adaptive mesh refinement uh, through the Samurai libraries from Lawrence Livermore. Uh, IBAMR is used by research groups around the globe. It is also used by the, let's see, medical device and uh, radiological health unit of the US FDA. So they actually use this software to validate artificial heart valves, sort of. And uh, I guess my final point would be, it is really heartening for me to see a talented researcher with major theoretical accomplishments supporting a key piece of computational infrastructure. So I am fascinated and really excited to hear what Boyce has to say today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Boyce Griffith. So I'll, I'll see if I can live up to Matt's very uh, generous introduction. Uh, uh, Sam asked for an introduction, and I, th I think that Matt used, um, uh, well, I think what I said was that I'm associate professor of mathematics at UNC. Uh, but, but, but seriously, I, 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 I'm uh, sincerely um, appreciative of the opportunity to give this uh, presentation. And, um, and, and indeed, what, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, uh, the development of mathematical models and computational methods for uh, problems in fluid structure interaction in biology. So fluid structure interaction is ubiquitous in nature, and it occurs at essentially all biological scales. And I wanted to start with some examples. So, so this, is a, this is an amazing movie. It's an amazing for, for, for many different reasons, but so, so I, should, I should explain what you're looking at. So this is, this is a movie obtained using tilted light sheet selected plane illumination microscopy. And it's, and it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, it's live cell imaging of, uh, of dividing cells early in embryonic development of uh, C. elegans embryos. And uh, there, there are many things about this movie that are, that, are, that are really amazing, but the thing that I wanted to specifically point out is that you can see these flashes of light that show up as the cell divides, as the chromosomes condense, segregate from each other, and then decondense during cell division. So this is fundamentally a, a, a process that involves fluid structure interaction. Fluid structure interaction is also, is also a critical part of uh, the, the, the left-right body plan uh, uh, development. So I think most people um, uh, sort of recognize that your heart is sort of on the left side of your body. Your, your liver is sort of on the right side of your body. The, your left brain and your right brain are different. Different people have different left brains and right brains. But, but the, the, the left brain and right brain are different. So, so, so something establishes this asymmetric body plan, and, and, it's, and it's fluid structure interaction. So, so this is an experimental 
movie looking at a structure that forms an embryonic development called the ventral node. And in the ventral node, there's a fluid flow, and that fluid flow goes over cilia, and the, as the asymmetry of the microstructure of these cilia gives rise to a coordinated motion of the cilia sort of in this clockwise uh, pattern as viewed here. And, and, and that's, what, that's what tells your body your left from your right during development. So, so again, this is a fluid structure interaction um, uh, problem. So this is a movie that pr probably many of you have seen. The, so one, one thing that's, that's, that's also amazing about this movie, this is from the 1950s. So this is recorded using, um, using actual uh, sort of a film camera. But what we're looking at here is a uh, white blood cell. And this white blood cell is chasing after a bacterium. And, and I think we probably know how it's going to end for the bacterium. Uh, but, but sort of the, the, one of the, again, one of the points here is that this is fundamentally a fluid structure interaction problem. Moving up to the uh, to the organ scale, uh, so so fluid structure interaction is 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 is, is a important component of uh, cardiac uh, fluid dynamics, uh, cardiac mechanics. Um, it shows up in uh, in, in cardiovascular uh, mechanics, in um, in, uh, in, in in renal mechanics, in um, gastroenterological mechanics, in uh, in the mechanics of the of the um, of, of respiration. At the organ, at the organismal scale, uh, we have uh, swimming. Uh, so, so here, these are experimental movies of of, uh, um, of a moon jellyfish. Uh, it also shows up in in flying. And then you, you could argue that it shows up at the um, at the atmospheric scale. So, so the atmospheric scale, maybe this is a little bit of a stretch, but uh, you can think of seeds dispersing in the wind. So this is an incredible uh, 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 movie looking at the flow patterns that are induced by a spinning maple seed. So fluid structure interaction is ubiquitous in biology. So what I want to talk about next are methods, mathematical methods, and model problems to, uh, to, 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 to describe how to, how to address simulating these kinds of systems. And so we're, we're going to adopt an approach where we're going to describe the fluid mechanics in Eulerian form. So we're going to describe the fluid mechanics using fixed physical coordinates, say x1, x2, x3. These are fixed coordinates in a, for, for, the pres, for, for the purposes of this talk, a fixed region of physical space omega. Um, we're going to describe the motion of the fluid in terms of the velocity, pressure, and uh, uh, the applied force density that are going to all be described in an Eulerian form. And we're going to describe the, uh, the, the motion of the structure, uh, the deformation of the submerged structure, and uh, the forces that are generated by those deformations in Lagrangian form. So we're going to describe the motion of the, um, whoops, we're going to describe the motion of the structure using a uh, system of curvilinear coordinates that are attached to the structure. So um, we're going to, uh, at least initially, um, be using coordinates, uh, say, Q1 and Q2. We're going to keep track of the position of uh, material point Q at time t in terms of this deformation mapping chi. We're going to keep track of the Lagrangian forces that are generated by those deformations um, in, in Lagrangian form. And for uh, portions of the talk, we're going to need to keep track of exactly where the interface is. So gamma t is going to be the position of the, of the interface interface at, uh, at time t, and n's going to be the outward normal along that interface. So there are two different fundamental formulations of uh, problems of fluid structure interaction that I want to sort of briefly introduce. One of these formulations uses uh, integral transforms to connect the Lagrangian and Eulerian frames. So, so in, in this first formulation, what we have are the Eulerian incompressible Navier Stokes equations that are augmented by an Eulerian uh, elastic uh, body force density. So this is a body force density with respect to the physical coordinates um, x1, x2, x3. Uh, that uh, Eulerian body force density comes from this Lagrangian description of the mechanics. So we have this Lagrangian description of the of the uh, of this um, elastic body force. And in order to convert from this Lagrangian description into an Eulerian description, we're going to take this uh, Lagrangian description of the forces, multiply it by a delta function, and integrate over the uh, over the curvilinear coordinate space. And that gives us an equivalent Eulerian force density that uh, that, that corresponds to the Lagrangian forces. And we're going to use the adjoint operator to go from the velocities on the grid back to the velocities on the, on the interface. So we're going, to, we're going to take the Eulerian velocity field, we're going to multiply it by a delta function and integrate, in this case, over the entire computational domain omega to determine the motion of the interface. 
So, so, so the key thing to mention about this formulation for thin interfaces is that we, we take this force, this Lagrangian force, and we're applying it over an infinitesimally thin um, surface. And what that's going to do is it's going to induce fluid jumps. Uh, it, it's going to induce jumps in the fluid stress at the interface. And this, is, this follows from force balance. So the, the, the pressure and the shear stress are necessarily discontinuous at, along the submerged interface. And, and, and so there's, an, a, there's a completely equivalent formulation of the equations of fluid structure interaction, where instead of augmenting by a body force, we can say there are certain jump conditions that have to hold along the, uh, along the interface. And uh, those jump conditions, uh, here written in terms of the jump conditions for the pressure and the viscous shear stress, are related to the normal and the tangential components of the applied force. So in, in either case, in, in both of these formulations, we can, we can set up numerical methods for the equations of motion where, where we can actually use separate discretizations for the fluid and for the structure. So, so we can have a discretization of the fluid and the structure that doesn't require a uh, body-conforming grid. And, and this is a real advantage um, when, when it comes to sort of large-scale computing because mesh generation r remains a difficult problem. So we're, in general, we're going to talk about methods where we're, um, we're going to describe uh, the, the fluid equations. We're going to discretize the fluid equations on a Cartesian grid, and we're going dis to discretize the Lagrangian equations on a curvilinear mesh that conforms to the geometry of the immersed structure. And the, um, the first sort of numerical method that, uh, the, that, we're, that we're gonna, that we're gonna introduce is, is the classical immersed boundary method. So this is a, this is a numerical method for fluid structure interaction that goes back to work by Charlie Peskin in the 1970s. And, uh, the idea is to take this formulation of the equations of motion and we're going to replace the singular delta function kernels by a regularized version of the delta function. And so what that does is it says we're going to take forces on the interface and we're going to spread those forces out onto the nearby Cartesian grid locations. And, and the, the, the strength at which things are spread out is determined by the shape of this regularized delta function. And likewise, we're going to take this regularized delta function and we're going to use it to sample the Cartesian grid velocities. And we're going to use this, those samples of the Cartesian grid velocities to determine the motion of this immersed structure. And so that's, that's essentially the immersed boundary method. And this is probably the easiest thing that you can do with the immersed boundary method. So this is an example of a fluid structure interaction simulation where we have an infinitesimally thin elastic interface that's immersed in a viscous incompressible fluid. And so what I'm plotting here is the motion of the interface along with the pressure field that's induced by the forces that that interface is applying to the fluid. And, and it's really clear here that, in fact, this pressure is essentially discontinuous across the interface. So an advantage of this formulation is that because we have this Cartesian grid discretization of the, uh, of the Eulerian equations, uh, we can use things like adaptive mesh refinement so that we can zoom in and capture those discontinuous features um, uh, without having to use a uh, uniformly fine discretization for the entire computational domain. And, and, and this adaptively refined grid tracks the, mo the, the, the motion of this interface. Probably the, the, the most famous uh, uh, use of this immersed boundary method is, is in um, models of the heart that, that have been developed by, by Charlie Peskin and Dave McQueen um, over, over the past 40 years. So this is an example of, a, of, a, of an immersed boundary model of, uh, of a patient-specific model of a, of a heart uh, for, that, that came from a patient that has congestive heart failure. So this is a big, dilated heart. Um, it's not contracting very well, and, and that's actually because this is a patient uh, in, in whom, uh, whose, heart, whose heart is not contracting uh, very effectively. So for a Cartesian background grid, it's relatively easy to construct a regularized version of the delta function. And the idea with, uh, with, with the Cartesian background grid is that we can build a three-dimensional regularized delta function from one-dimensional regularized delta functions. And then we can talk about how to construct a one-dimensional regularized delta function for a long time. I'm just going to give you a, a particular recipe. Um, but, but in general, what you have is some kind of, uh, some kind of smooth curve, uh, some smooth kernel function that's rescaled in a way so that as the grid is refined, in some sense, the regular Singularized delta function approaches the, um, the, the, the singular delta function. So th there are a lot of different ways that you can construct regularized delta functions. This is a way of constructing a family of delta functions that's relatively uh, easy to uh, ex explain at least the construction. And, 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 and it's a construction that gives rise to uh, what are called B-spline kernels. And uh, the idea is that we're going to start out with a, um, with a, with a zeroth order B-spline. This is sometimes called a, the window function. And so if you can involve the window function with itself, you get uh, the familiar hat function. 
And so you can continue doing this. So you can, you can convolve the hat function with the window function, and you get something that's, that's smoother, um, sort of this bump looking thing. Um, and you can keep on going. So you can convolve the second order B spline kernel with the window function, and you get a third order B spline kernel, so on and so forth. So every time you do this, you get a, a kernel function that has more regularity. Um, it has sort of more approximation power, but the trade off is that the support gets broader and broader and broader. And so you have to balance, uh, you have to balance, uh, approximation power, uh, regularity, and computational efficiency. In practice, we really like to use this, uh, uh, sort of second order B spline kernel that has a support of three mesh widths for, for, for intermediate Reynolds number kinds of applications. If you're, if you're in sort of Stokes flow regime, um, uh, it, it's, it, there are different considerations. But so in any case, we can now briefly go through the, 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 the basic, um, the basic time stepping for, for how, how one of these schemes work. So, so the idea is that we're going to compute forces in the current configuration of the structure. We're going to take those forces. We're going to smear them out onto the background grid. We're going to solve the Navier Stokes equations using that regularized body force. We're going to use the velocities that we get from, uh, solving the Navier Stokes equations to determine the motion of the interface. And so that's a, that's a time step of the inverse boundary method. Of course, you can make this more accurate in time by using higher order time stepping schemes. And what we're going to do for, uh, for, for sort of compactness is we're going to say that this operator that converts from Lagrangian forces into Eulerian forces is a spreading operator S, and the operator that goes from Eulerian velocities to Lagrangian velocities is, is, is its adjoint J. So the other kind of method that you can develop that's based on this jump condition formulation is, is what's called the immersed interface method. And the immersed interface method dates back to um, work by Randy Levesque and Jilin Lee in the 90s. And uh, this, the, the initial immersed interface methods were extended by Jilin Lee and, uh, and by Ming-Chi Lai and others to, to deal with the Navier Stokes equations in the uh, early 2000s. And again, the idea is that we have a jump condition for the pressure and a jump condition for the viscous shear stress that are related to the forces that are being applied along the interface. So, so how do you handle jump conditions? There are different ways you can imagine doing this, but if you're using sort of a finite difference sort of framework, one of the ideas that you can use is, well, if you have a function that has known discontinuities in some part of your interval, you can use a generalized Taylor series analysis to say that the, uh, that, that you can approximate the derivative using basically a standard finite difference approximation along with the correction that comes from the inhomogeneous term that, that, that's related to the jump conditions. And in the applications that we're talking about, those jump conditions directly come from the forces that we're applying along the interface. And so, and so really what you can do is you can, is you can take these jump condition terms and you can move them over to the right hand side and use a standard, um, a standard incompressible Navier Stokes solver, just like you can for the immersed boundary method. So the idea is that you have some kind of force spreading operator that's tailored to this immersed interface discretization that takes forces from the Lagrangian mesh to the background grid. You solve the Navier Stokes equations. You get velocities, and then you have a different operator that you use to determine the motion of the interface. So one difficulty of these methods, at least right now, one sort of theoretical difficulty that, that, I, think, that, I, that I think hasn't been completely addressed yet is that these spreading and interpolation operators, if you think of them as such, uh, for the immersed interface method, are not adjoint pairs of operators, and so it's difficult to construct time-stepping schemes that are guaranteed to converge, uh, to, to, uh, to, to conserve energy. But in practice, these methods can be quite effective. So this is an example, sort of maybe, maybe the second simplest thing that you can do with an immersed boundary kind of uh, computation. This is flow past the stationary cylinder. Uh, we're visualizing the, uh, we're visualizing the vortex street that comes off of the, of the cylinder. This is the uh, well-known von Karman vortex street. Um, the colors here um, are uh, the vorticity. Um, and this is a comparison of what you get with an immersed boundary and an immersed interface scheme applied to the same problem. So with the immersed boundary method, what we're getting is um, we're, 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 we're getting good detail in the, in the wake. If you zoom in and look at what's going on right at the interface, what you see is there's actually counter-rotating flow in the interior of the cylinder. And, and if you think about it, it sort of has to be the case because the way that the immersed boundary method works is that it samples the velocity using a smooth kernel function over a finite, um, a, a finite difference. And so if you want to set up forces that are going to act to keep that interface stationary, it's necessarily going to be the case that you have an external flow that's going along uh, the, uh, the cylinder in the streamlined direction, there has to be, a, uh, has to be a, a, a counter flow in the interior to maintain this stationarity constraint. 
If you look at what happens with the immersed interface kind of discretization, it's, 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 it's quite strikingly different. Uh, we have essentially no flow in the interior of the interface. And, and the reason is that it uses a different scheme for determining the motion of the interface from the background velocity field that's able to account for the um, discontinuities in the velocity field. These kinds of methods are also amenable to um, structured adaptive mesh refinement. And something that we've been doing recently is extending them to work for um, rigid body fluid structure interaction with an eye towards doing um, flexible body fluid structure interaction. So this is an example of, of vertex induced vibrations in a cylinder uh, uh, for a string, spring mounted cylinder. And uh, uh, this is a um, galloping uh, sort of block. One other thing that's a little bit difficult to, to handle are sharp corners, um, and we have some versions of the immersed interface method where we're using ideas from discontinuous Galerkin methods to talk about how to set up jump conditions along um, uh, geometries that have sort of fundamentally uh, uh, sharp features. Now, most of this work is being done by Amin Kouladouz, who um, uh, has a joint postdoctoral position between uh, UNC Chapel Hill and the Food and Drug Administration. The, the Food and Drug Administration um, is, is not interested in galloping um, uh, blocks. Um, Maybe, 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 maybe I, I, I shouldn't overgeneralize. Probably some people are. But uh, so it was really what we're, we're, we're doing with this is we're developing um, uh, tools for modeling flows in um, the inferior vena cava. So the inferior vena cava is the major vein that brings the oxygenated blood from the lower extremities back to the heart. And um, uh, in order to um, model flows in the interior, in, inferior vena cava, um, the FDA has developed an idealized inferior vena cava model um, whose geometry is based on sort of an average of multiple patient data sets. And uh, these are some initial uh, computations using this immersed interface scheme uh, with this geometry, looking at flows uh, just up, just downstream of the convergence of the right and left iliac veins. You have this complicated swirling flow that persists as you move on up. And then looking at the sort of third slice, this is uh, an immersed interface um, uh, uh, computational result. And this is a corresponding computational result using a body conforming discretization uh, implemented in open foam. And it, it's a little bit difficult to see this on the screen, but there's, there's very good quantitative agreement between uh, these two discretization approaches. So the, the application area that we really are targeting here is modeling um, is modeling uh, uh, inferior vena cava filters. So um, patients who have a condition known as deep vein thrombosis, so you have, you have large blood clots in your legs, um, are at risk of developing pulmonary embolism. So, so you can have a clot that gets sort of squeezed out, it can go up your inferior vena cava, and it can lodge in your lungs, and that can be a, um, a, that, that can be a, a, a fatal event. So many patients can be managed using anticoagulants, but some can't. And some of those patients receive um, these devices called inferior vena cava filters. Inferior vena cava filters have proved to be actually quite difficult to study in large-scale clinical trials, and so what we're aiming to do is to develop models that can help to understand when they work and when they don't work. So this is an ongoing project. It leads me into what I want to talk about next, is how do you extend this formulation to talk about immersed bodies? So the formulations we've talked about so far are talking about immersed interfaces or immersed boundaries. How do you do immersed bodies? So just briefly, we're, we're considering a system where um, we have um, a fluid and a solid, the solid's immersed in the fluid, and we're gonna talk about the stress tensor for both the fluid and the solid, at the, sort of at the same time. So we're, we're talking about the stress tensor for this sort of coupled fluid structure system. And for simplicity, we can, we can sort of relax this assumption, but for simplicity, we're gonna assume that there's a viscous stress, a stress that corresponds to a viscous incompressible fluid that's existing throughout the entire computational domain, and then in the solid region only, there are additional stresses that come from the solid deformations. And we're going to continue to use a Lagrangian description of the solid mechanics, and so it's going to be convenient to actually pose the solid mechanic models in terms of the first piel of Kirchhoff stress. So if, um, uh, you, you, if you want to get the, the Cauchy stress from the first piel of Kirchhoff stress, what you do is you multiply by uh, the transpose of the deformation gradient tensor. So this is the derivative of this mapping from uh, material coordinates or reference coordinates to current coordinates, and then rescale by the Jacobian determinant of that deformation gradient. And, uh, a convenient thing to remember is that if you um, have a hyperelastic material, so you have a material where the material response is determined by a strain energy functional, you can get the uh, first piel Kirchhoff stress by taking the derivative of that, uh, of that strain energy functional with respect to the deformation gradient tensor. 
So the equations that you wind up with look something like this. So again, you have the Incompressible and Navier Stokes equations. Now we have two Eulerian body forces. And the two Eulerian body forces both come from this applied, uh, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this um, uh, elastic stress tensor. So there's a, there's a body force that's distributed in the interior of the structure. And then there's a traction-like force. And this traction-like force sort of has to be there in order for the formulation to satisfy force balance of the fluid structure interface. And one brief comment about this formulation is that we're using a common velocity field for both the fluid and the structure. There's only one velocity field here. We have the incompressibility constraint. It applies throughout the computational domain. The whole domain is incompressible. The solid in particular is automatically incompressible in this formulation. Now, dealing with this second um, uh, uh, interfacial force is a little bit inconvenient, and so what you can do is you can introduce a formulation where uh, you, you sort of use a weak version of uh, this, uh, this uh, relationship between this, the stress and the force to eliminate that interfacial force, and you're back with a uh, scheme that's very similar to uh, sort of a standard immersed boundary kind of method where you have a force that's applied over the body, and um, uh, and, 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 and you use that with your navier stokes solver to determine the motion of the structure. So just to briefly walk you through how the coupling scheme works, imagine that you have forces that are defined on, say, uh, finite elements that, uh, that cover the structure. Um, we want to take the forces from the uh, finite element mesh, and we're going to um, apply them to the background um, Cartesian grid. In this case, what we're going to think in terms of is we have a Eulerian force density that's related to the Lagrangian force density, again, by an integral transform with the regular delta function kernel, but we can break up this integral into integrals over the individual elements and then we can apply sort of standard quadrature rules in order to discretize these elemental integrals. And so we sample our forces at the quadrature points. We spread those forces out onto the background grid. That builds up our force field that we use to solve the incompressible linear resource equations. To determine the velocity of the structure, you do the same operations, but in reverse. You sample the velocities at the quadrature points, and then you um, solve a mass matrix system to determine what the velocity is at the nodes. And, and you can think of this as doing sort of an L2 projection of the regular velocity that you would get if you use the standard immersed boundary formulation for this interpolation scheme. So, so does this work? So, so here's a test. This is a torsion test where you have an elastic beam, and we're going to twist it, and, um, and, and we're going to see what happens. We're going to twist it up, um, and, oh, all right, okay, so, so this does not work. Uh, this is, this, this, we, we get some very bad results. Um, and so, 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 so let's try again. So let's add in a, uh, let's add in a penalty term. So, so a volumetric penalty term. What's, what's happening very clearly in that first test is that we're losing the incompressibility constraint. Even though in the continuum equations we have incompressibility everywhere, and the discrete equations we don't. So we're going to try to stabilize our formulation by adding in an energy that um, that penalizes uh, that penalizes compressible deformations. We try this again. We twist it up. We get much better results. But so what I'm plotting here is the Jacobian determinant along the structure. We're still losing some volume. So the, the last thing that you can try doing, well, there, 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 there are many things you can try doing, but the last thing we tried doing was to, um, to change the formulation to use a so-called modified deformation gradient when we're computing the, uh, the, the, the deviatoric part of the stress. So we're going to be um, using a, a deformation gradient where we sort of projected out the dilational part, and when we do this, now we recover very good incompressibility in this relatively challenging benchmark. So, so how does this compare to a finite, like a standard finite element method? So here we're looking at the tip displacement as a function of the number of structural degrees of freedom, um, where we have either um, added this extra volumetric penalty or not, and where we've either modified the form of the deformation gradient or not. And you can see that if you both um, stabilize by adding this volumetric penalty and also um, and also modify the deformation gradients, you get results that are in extremely good agreement with. Um, um, with, with, with benchmark um, incompressible, elasti uh, incompressible elasticity results. Okay. So, uh, so Matt already mentioned that, I, that, that, that uh, we have this IBAMR software. So, so, so Matt already said, it right, so relies on Petsy, Samurai, Hyper, all the finite element stuff we're doing uses uh, LibMesh. It does a lot of different things. Um, I can't tell you about all of them. Uh, we can handle thin rods. We can um, imp uh, impose deformational constraints. Um, uh, there's been work uh, to incorporate thermal fluctuations. Uh, I have a PhD student who's finishing up support for handling complex polymeric fluids. Um, and uh, there's a PhD student uh, who, who actually just finished um, at Northwestern working with Nilesh Panikers group who's been adding multi-phase flow uh, capabilities. So th these are biomedical applications, but I thought that they were too cool to not um, show you. So th this is fluid structure interaction with a sort of deformational, um, uh, a constrained deformation sort of approach. Okay. So 
applications in biology. So, so we've worked with a lot of different groups over the years who have, who have taken this immersed boundary code and, and have applied it to different applications. One of the first uh, uh, people to do this was, is, is Lisa Fauci, who's here in the second row. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and Lisa um, wanted to use this code uh, to simulate aquatic locomotion. And so the main thing that you get by using this adaptive mesh refinement um, infrastructure for these kinds of simulations is um, you're able to resolve the details of the flow dynamics without having to use a uniformly fine computational grid. So, so this is the grid. It's a little hard to see. We're going to zoom in. We're going to zoom in some more. So we're using very high spatial resolution, resolution that you wouldn't want to use a uniformly fine grid to, uh, to tackle. And um, the, one of the um, main initial applications of this um, in, 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 um, in Lisa's group was to study the role of um, body elasticity on uh, swimming performance. This is in a neuromechanical model of a lamprey. So if you don't know what a lamprey is, um, um, that you should Google it after, but we just ate lunch. So, so, so hopefully, so they're, 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 they're pretty gruesome animals. Um, uh, they're, they're sort of, um, uh, they're sort of in some sense the simplest vertebrate animals. Um, they're, um, they're sort of ancient, uh, fish that don't have jaws or, anyway. But so it's a popular model organism for understanding neuromechanics. And here it's clear that, um, uh, that there's a difference in swimming speed as to whether you're sort of floppy, relatively stiff, are very stiff, and you can quantify this. So very floppy doesn't swim very fast. If you're floppy but not so floppy, you swim faster. If you're an intermediate stiffness, you swim pretty fast. And if you're very stiff, you swim a little bit more slowly, and you can quantify that. However, if you think about not in terms of long-term performance, but in terms of acceleration, then you get a different answer. So if you're very floppy, or if you're floppy, the acceleration is a little bit different. Intermediate is not as good as floppy. And then if you're stiff, you're actually quite slow in terms of acceleration. So, so you can imagine that the animal is having to make decisions about whether um, it's, uh, about its, about its body stiffness, depending on whether it's trying to swim a long distance or if it's trying to escape from prey. Escape from a predator, sorry. Maybe, maybe it's going after prey. Um, so, so Lanush Paddinker's group at Northwestern has done similar kinds of computations, but using a very different uh, 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 way of determining the, the motion of the body. So here what they're doing is instead of um, describing um, the neuromechanics of swimming, they are uh, prescribing the deformational kinematics uh, based on experimental images of, um, of swimming fish. And one of the things that you can do with this kind of formulation is um, you can train one of these swimmers to find, uh, to find some food. So this is a, this is a swimmer. It knows it's, it's able to measure the angle between its swimming direction and where the, um, where its target is, and it can adjust its body locomotion, uh, it, it, its body configuration to, to, to find that food. Daphne Closto's group at UNC is, uh, using, um, uh, uh, is using these methods to look at idealized swimmers. So this is a swimming mechanism where you have two, um, two rigid spheres um, that are of different sizes. And um, they're, they're, they're moving sort of antipodally. And depending on the Reynolds number, the, one of the things that's interesting about this is the thing either swims backwards or it swims forward. And so it's, this is using sort of a free, stream, free streaming kind of uh, uh, swimming motion. And they're extending this to look at um, uh, collections of swimmers as sort of models of, of active, um, uh, active systems. Laura Miller, um, who's also at UNC, has been um, using these methods to look at um, the swimming of jellyfish. Um, and so this is the jellyfish bell um, that is, that's turning. We're using a formulation, um, sort of this, um, uh, um, this uh, um, finite element sort of formulation for the, uh, for, for, for the immersed boundary method, where we're describing both the elastic um, uh, properties of the jellyfish bell as well as the active muscle contraction. And you can perform similar kinds of experiments looking at the role of body stiffness in terms of swimming speed. And, um, and you, can, you can sort of computationally demonstrate that if the jellyfish pumps at, its, uh, at the resonant frequency of the elastic bell, you get optimal uh, swimming speeds. These are simulations that, um, that Alex Huber, who's done a lot, who's done a lot of this work, um, uh, recently provided me that I think are very cool. So here what, 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 what Alex is looking at is the role of, um, of the activation wave speed in the rotational kinematics of the jellyfish. And so going from left to right, we have a slow wave going from right to left, a faster wave going from right to left, and a very fast wave. So these waves are different each by a, uh, uh, an order of magnitude. And depending on the, depending on the velocity of this activation wave, the, 
the, the jellyfish bell either swims sort of slowly forward, it turns, or it swims a little bit more rapidly forward. All right. So applications in medicine. So, so currently, Nilesh Panikar's group is using these methods to look at um, uh, models of the GI tract. And so they start off looking at the esophagus, and uh, the, the applications here, they're trying, to, um, they're trying to relate forces that you can measure through clinical uh, devices, um, uh, uh, relate those forces to, uh, to, to, to um, disorders of the esophagus. And so these are, these are sort of motility disorders that can be associated with um, esophageal cancers. And so, so um, they're, they're developing modeling tools that can help to explain what the measurements are that you get from these endoscopic uh, measurements of uh, uh, forces along the esophagus. And uh, they've also been working on uh, models of the stomach. And uh, here the applications are for um, or for gastroesophageal reflux disease. So, so gastroesophageal reflux disease um, is, is what causes heartburn in some people. Um, it, it affects, it depends on where you look, it affects between 10 and 30% of the population. It results in millions of hospitalizations um, every year in the United States. Okay, so in the time that I have left, I wanna tell you about some things that we're doing in modeling the heart. So the heart has, well, oh, here's a little, little anatomy lesson. The heart has four chambers. It has uh, two upper chambers, the, whoops, two upper chambers, the, the atria, right atrium and left atrium, and the ventricles, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So the job of the atria is to get uh, blood into the ventricles, and the job of the ventricles, well, in the case of the left ventricle, is to get blood throughout the body, oxygenated blood throughout the body. The job of the right ventricle is to get deoxygenated blood from the body back to the lungs. In each chamber, um, going, from the, uh, going from the atrium to the ventricle, you have an inflow valve. On the left side, it's the mitral valve. Going from the ventricle out into the aorta, you have a valve, the aortic valve. The corresponding structures on the right side are the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve. And uh, so, so we've been working for a while on constructing um, uh, sort of patient-specific models of, uh, of um, uh, the heart and the nearby great vessels. So this is a typical sort of CT scan image uh, that, you, uh, that you might get. And um, from these image data, you can reconstruct the anatomy. Um, we're not gonna simulate um, the entire circulation. So uh, focusing in, in this case, just on the, uh, on the flow through the aortic valve into the ascending aorta and stopping before the, uh, the aortic arch, and in order to establish um, driving and loading conditions, we have, a, we have sort of a prescribed pressure upstream, and then we use uh, what's called a Windcastle model. It's an RCR circuit model to describe the impedance properties of the downstream part of the circulation, and th this is a sort of example simulation that you can do. So for a while, I've been interested in, in sort of demonstrating the extent to which these kinds of simulations are, are, are accurate or, or realistic. So, so we've been working for a while on validating the results of these kinds of computations. And the approach that we're taking to validate is to use an in vitro model of the heart. So this is like a table heart, table top heart model. Um, it has a rigid left atrium. It has a flexible bag for the left ventricle. It has an inflow valve. It has an outflow valve. It has an ascending aorta. It's all quite idealized. This is what it looks like in, in, in action. I don't, I don't know how easy it is to see, but there's this flexible bag at the bottom that's being actuated by a programmable piston pump, and it's driving flow through the aortic valve. So here's a better view of this flexible bag, and um, this is what, uh, um, what a bioprosthetic heart valve does when you put it in the system. So. There are, two, there are two basic classes of bioprosthetic, or there are two basic classes of prosthetic heart valves that are used in, in, in surgical practice. There are uh, what are called mechanical valves, and there are bioprosthetic valves. So bioprosthetic valves have flexible leaflets that are made of um, animal tissues, pig valve tissue or uh, bovine or, or porcine pericardial tissue. And what we're doing is we have a model of the aortic test section of this device that's been calibrated using um, data that's acquired from the device. And so these are example simulations of flows in this in vitro model of the aorta. On the left, we have a model of, the, uh, of, of, of one of these mechanical valves. And on the right is a bioprosthetic valve. And so qualitatively, there are very big differences in terms of the flow pattern. So, so the, 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 the mechanical valve, you have sort of two large jets along the, along the, the left and the right, and a sort of a smaller jet along the middle. With the bioprosthetic valve, you have this large central jet along the center. The 
bioprosthetic valve is able to close essentially with no leak, whereas there's a large amount of regurgitation as this uh, bilethal mechanical valve closes. We're looking at the performance of um, two different kinds of bioprosthetic valves. So we're looking at uh, bovine pericardial uh, valves. So these are valves made of the pericardium, that, the sac that, 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 um, that envelops the heart, um, and porcine uh, bioprosthetic valves, so, the, so valves made from pig uh, heart valves. And these are both flexible valves. You sort of, it's not a big surprise that the flow dynamics are quite similar. The structure of these valves is actually fairly different. So the bovine pericardial valve, you have fibers that typically are oriented sort of 45 degrees with respect to the circumferential direction for the valve, whereas with a porcine valve, you have fibers that span from commissure to commissure. And you can fit the mechanical properties of, uh, of, of models of these valves to experimental data. And the differences in the fiber orientations of these valves actually gives rise to different behaviors as the valve closes. So in the bovine pericardial valve, what, you, what happens is that this 45 degree um, rotation causes the valve to sort of twist as it closes. You can kind of see the valve twist in, as it closes. On the other hand, for the, uh, for the porcine valve, what happens is that you have these structures called the, uh, the nodes of Arantia, so the, the nodules. It's a thickening of the valve leaflets. And so the idea of the design of this bioprocess valve is that this twisting that's induced by, the, um, by the, the particular patterning of the fibers is supposed to help do this job that in a native valve would be done by the, the nodes of Arantius. So these are just comparisons of, um, of uh, valve kinematics using high-speed video. This is for the uh, bovine uh, pericardial valve, looking at flow rates, pressures, and we're quantifying the orifice area of the valve. So these are all in pretty good agreement. We're pretty happy with these. We want to, I think, make them a little bit better, pretty good. These are comparisons for the porcine valve. And the porcine valve, we, I, I think, have excellent agreement in terms of these bulk properties. So this is looking at a comparison of the flow rates, getting the right kinds of flow. Uh, closure transients requires tuning the boundary condition models. This is looking at the pressure differences. The pressure differences are in extremely good agreement across the valve. Um, the closed valve, when it's closed, supports a realistic pressure load and it does not leak. Um, and then this is a quantification of the open area. And uh, the, the, the shaded region is sort of scatter in the experimental data. And given the amount of scatter that's in the data, I think that we're doing quite a good job in terms of capturing the, uh, the kinematics of the leaflets. Okay. So what we're trying to do next is to quantify the flow patterns. And so these are just some very initial uh, results looking at uh, PIV uh, in, this, uh, in this system. And um, th these, are, these are still very qualitative comparisons, but we're getting the right, the flow is sort of hugging the left uh, part of the channel, and, um, and we have a little bit of uh, reverse flow along the right part of the channel. So, so, so I think we're in the right direction. We still have some more work to do in terms of, in terms of the final sort of story for um, comparing to PIV data. So I'm out of time, but I, I, I'm gonna quickly show you some results of uh, using the same kinds of models to simulate uh, flow in, in, a, in a realistic uh, model of the heart. So we have a model of the heart that includes all the structures of the real heart, left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, aortic valve on the left. On the right side, the right atrium, tricuspid valve, the right ventricle, and the pulmonic valve. We have models of the valve leaflets that recapitulate the fiber structures of real valve leaflets, as well as the mechanical properties of real valve leaflets uh, for, for both the outflow valves, the aortic and pulmonary valves, as well as the inflow valves, the mitral and tricuspid valves. We have models that are able to uh, capture the mechanics of the, of the heart wall. So in order to do this, you have to make a mathematical model of the fiber structure of the wall. It's, it's, it's not feasible to construct um, high resolution reconstructions of the fiber structure from uh, available medical image data. And these are some initial simulations using this model. So we have just one cycle. But so, so, so we have atrial systole followed by ventricular systole, and sort of everything is working the way that we want it to work. So we have um, the, 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 the inflow valves are closing and, and are preventing regurgitation, the outflow valves are opening. And these are some visualizations of the resulting flows. So. So fluid structure interaction is ubiquitous. It shows up all over the place in biology. We have some methods. We, we and many other people have, have methods, um, both mathematical and computational, um, to develop models for all of these different scales. There still are a lot of opportunities to improve simulation fidelity. But nonetheless, I would say that these methods are being successfully used and validated for a number of important applications in biology and medicine. So thank you very much.
So, uh, <clears throat> then when you're uh, doing the comparison to uh, experiment, how do you get error bars on your simulation? Is it a priori stuff, or do you run it a bunch of times, or what do you do? So, so, so that's a that's a good question, and it brings up something we haven't done yet. So, so we don't have error bars on the simulation. We have error bars for the experiments. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So, so, so that's not something that we've done yet. Right. Yeah. And then for most of those, are you using um, uh, direct solvers to just be sure, or are you using the iterative stuff for the stuff when you validate? Yeah, so so we, we use, um, so, so the only solve that we have to do in um, the time stepping schemes that we use for most of these computations um, is a, is a multi-grid solve for the, uh, for the Stokes equations. Right. And for that, uh, or sorry, is, is a solve for the Stokes equations, and for that we use a multi-grid solve. Um, okay. So we're using, um, we're using a version of the fast adaptive composite uh, oh, okay. uh, uh, method for that. Yeah. Okay. So when the valves are opening and closing, are you prescribing that motion, or is that directly coupled with the flow? We prescribe nothing. Uh, so uh, we, I mean, we, we prescribe boundary conditions, but no, we, the the motions that we're getting are, are the result of doing the fluid structure interaction um, computation. Yeah. So there's no prescribed motion in terms of the valve leaflets at all. Wow. Awesome. Uh, thanks for this nice talk. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, by curiosity. How much time does it take to set up such a simulation? Like this last one you showed, it's extremely complex. So can you say something about it? Yeah, it, so it's, it, it, so, so, right, so, so this heart model, I'm gonna, this heart model took a, has taken a long time, so, I mean, and we're not done setting it up yet, right? So we're still fine tuning it for sure. Um, we started working on this about, um, sort of in earnest about a, about a year ago, um, and, um, and it's taken about a year to get to here. One of the things actually that slowed us down is not so much the model construction per se, but that um, uh, we, uh, in running this model, uncovered some performance issues with the code, and, um, uh, and, and so the computations were taking a very long time, and so there's this big lag between you make a modification and you get the result, um, and uh, by doing some um, relatively straightforward optimizations, we've been able to speed up things a lot, and we're able to sort of increase the throughput in terms of um, parameter sweeps and things like that. And so I, th I think actually going forward, um, uh, it's going to be easier to set up. But I mean, right now it's a time consuming task. That said, I think that um, this is the first model that we've set up. I think that our second one would be faster. And so, you know, it's something where you can imagine um, developing smart tools to, to assist with. Thank you. Do you use any CAD tools when you do that, or is it all? We have a complicated workflow. Ah, uh, I can imagine. <laughs> okay, it looks like there are no other questions, so thank you very much, boys, for the fascinating talk. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope to see you at the next plenary.